So for this week, I'm sure you guys already have seen the discussion post, the Ed Puzzle. Um, all of these, if you look at some deadlines, today is your discussion post due. Okay, so you have until tonight to do that. Tomorrow is going to be your quizzes. Our goal is to get 100%. We have unlimited tries on that. And on Friday, Mrs. Watkins, would you like to tell us, I think our, our flip grid is going to be something about food, right? Yeah, we'll get to that. It's okay, gonna... we'll get to that. But we are going but the flip to... flipgrids so far have been amazing. So we want yes, to provide I you more opportunities that. to up your flip grid skills. Awesome. And some more cool yeah, stuff. I saw some interesting stuff. Um, hopefully, Mrs. Watkins, you can also show some of um, Mrs. White's third period um, elements, compounds, flip grid at home. Oh, my God. They were so amazing. I was watching all of them last night. And I thought I will share it with you and for your yeah. other classmates to see. All right? Yes, ma'am. Cool. So here are two things today. Lesson slide about organic compounds. We'll know more about that. It looks, it sounds kind of like unfamiliar, but you are very familiar about it. And of course, some kitchen chemistry on our breakout session. All right? So our focus today we'll try to find out what are those organic compounds, what are the main groups of organic compounds, which we already know, and why are they important, such as our carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. This is not new to us. We've heard of this in our life science unit. And of course, we wanna know where we encounter these compounds in real life. So we're always gonna connect that to our- Always. Life. As That's our BMIO, right? Yeah. Science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, yep. that input and output. So as we're getting this new information, how are we applying it to the world outside of us or how does it relate to us? Perfect. So that being said, I wanted to let your taste buds drip a little bit with this video that I'm going to show you. And before we start, maybe while you are watching also, I want you to list down on your paper two foods that you have in mind, okay? We Remember, everybody should have a pen two, and paper. Yep, this two food later on after our lesson, okay? So before I play, oh, maybe I'll start playing it now. And while you're thinking about it, while you're watching, think about those two foods, just two, okay? And then write it down, all right? So... Sit back, relax. We are going to look at the Maillard reaction that makes everything taste so good. All right? Yum. Makes steaks melt delicious chemical reactions. The Maillard reaction. If you've ever cooked or heck, even if you've ever made toast, the Maillard reaction has transformed your raw ingredients into something that tastes crazy good. Sometimes called the browning reaction, Maillard actually involves a cascade of many chemical reactions all happening while your food is cooking. These reactions involve the sugars and foods rich in carbohydrates, think bread and potatoes, and amino acids, the building blocks of proteins that make up dairy, meat, and nuts. More importantly to cooks and people who like deliciousness, it produces hundreds of compounds, some of which contribute amazing smells and flavors to cooked food. You've got your alkyl pyrazines, which contribute the cocoa flavor or nutty roasted flavor in coffee, or the caramel-like pheromones found in bread and toast, or the meaty thiophenes that pop up in, you know, meat as well as garlic. The color of beer, the smell of popcorn, and even cookies all wouldn't be the same without the Maillard reaction. Since French chemist Louis Camille Maillard first reported this tasty transformation about 100 years ago, scientists have been trying to sort out what actually happens during the Maillard reaction. They're still working on all the details, but here's the gist. Imagine you're cooking a steak, or if you're a vegetarian, a bean-based patty. The amino acids in the steak react with sugary compounds and create a bunch of intermediate compounds. The structure of these products get rearranged and you end up with other compounds. We won't get into the details of these reactions, there are a lot of them, but these intermediates eventually turn into a whole range of delicious flavor and aroma compounds. Or, as a friend of the show and chemistry professor Matt Hardings puts it, all sorts of things happen in this reaction, but eventually you get to Flavortown. So we've gone over the research, and now we've got some tips to make Maillard work for your food. The Maillard reaction works best somewhere between 230 and 340 degrees Fahrenheit. 
In this range, the chemical reactions are faster and the heat evaporates excess water. If the temperature is too high, burning creates charred bitter flavors, so check your temp. If you're in a rush, increasing the pH levels of some foods will speed up the Maillard reaction. Browning some onions, try adding a tiny pinch of baking soda along with a bit of salt for flavor. Baking soda is basic and will increase the pH of the onions. The onions will not only brown faster, they will have a sweet flavor with hints of caramel. Thanks, Maillard! By the way, this doesn't mean your onions caramelize, that process only involves sugars. Oh, and don't add too much baking soda, or you'll have brown, mealy, onion goo. Alright! So, just a little review from last week when we talked about elements, compounds, and mixtures. So just a little bit information. Elements are pure substance, cannot be broken down. Compounds, two or more elements that have been chemically combined. And we saw in that Maillard reaction, that actually is a reaction happening when you cook your food and because of those compounds kind of like reacting together, that's why it's called a Maillard reaction. Then it creates those amazing deliciousness flavor. All right? So... And of course, when these compounds break down, it, it becomes simpler substance, and we learned that last week. All right? So organic chemistry has to do with these basic food groups or food um, compounds that we actually enjoy eating. And all of these contains, uh, they contain carbon. And originally, they're limited just uh, for living organisms, but now humans... humans are able to actually synthesize products that could also be considered as organic, okay? So such as cosmetics, so that's, that's why we have organic, um, organic products that we produce because they are um, compounds that contain carbon, okay? And also medicine and uh, plastics as well. They are organic and they are biodegradable. Anything that says biodegradable, they are all organic. I have a quick question, Mrs. White. Off of carbon, what was one of the very first molecules we learned about in science seventh grade? You can sign it in the chat or raise your hand. It has to do with carbon. Yeah, I think if you can and in the chat and I'll read out your answer, that would Okay, Ooh, what I is see it? it, Kenzie. Anybody? Kenzie said glucose. Glucose. Is that right? It sure. is. Yes, it is. Good job. So we know, looking at this diagram that I have here, these are your elements of the organic compounds. So if you notice, you have carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and also sulfur and phosphate. And these are... Uh, these are your biomolecules that ha everybody, including uh, lower forms of organisms, have these biomolecules. And they occur in us, within us, and we are mostly composed of carbon and hydrogen. So these are the two most abundant elements that we know of when we're talking about biomolecules. So inorganic compounds, so if there's organic, there's inorganic. Anything that does not have carbon and hydrogen are inorganic, and it is not made from living matter. So sometimes you can find that in rocks, minerals, um, example, of course, your salt, water, and carbon dioxide. So these are inorganic, obviously, because they don't have any carbon and hydrogen compound together. Okay, so that's the difference between the two. And these are your sources of organic compounds. For animals, you have proteins and uh, fats. And then for plants, you have carbohydrates, proteins, vitamins, and oils. And then for dead plants, we can find coal, petroleum, and gas as an organic compound, which is a product of uh, decomposed plants. And we have encountered all of these, and we're going to take a look at them in detail today, right? Yes. So how do they form? There's what we call monomers and polymers. These are just a fancy term for building blocks of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, okay? Mono means one, so it, one unit of monomer 
is pretty much like a one piece of a chain of your carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Because we know that organic compounds are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, if you put them together, just like a chain or a link, that becomes a polymer. And they become a large molecule made of monomer. So if you chain them up, that becomes your polymer. And all our organic compounds we're going to talk about is polymers, okay? The most exciting part is our four main groups of carbon compounds. So let's take a look at each of them closely. Let's start first with the very, very yummy carbohydrates. Let's... Oh, oh, this is my I, favorite. Well, and even before we get to carbohydrates, you guys probably are already connected to them if you even know it or not. Do you like pizza? Do you like pasta? Do you eat bread, right? Those are the big three. And also, maybe if you're an athlete, you might have had a coach say, hey, you better carb load before a big game or make sure you eat some carbs before the tournament or something because they want you to have those complex carbohydrates, those complex compounds. So they'll break down slowly over time to give your body energy throughout the relay, throughout the race, throughout the tournament. Yes, but do not over... No, <laughs> but so going back to carbohydrates, carbohydrates is composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And the longer your polymer chain, the longer your chain is, the more complex the carbohydrate is. And of course, like Mrs. Watkins mentioned, carbohydrates is a source of energy. You get and store energy in carbohydrates. An example would be your glucose. Glucose is the simplest form of sugar. Okay, you find that in your table sugar. Fruits is another example. Now you call that fructose. So we're not going to get into that, but I'm just trying to mention another scientific name for that. And of course, you have vegetables and starches. These are a little bit more complex carbohydrates, um, such as bread, pasta, um, even plants. There's cellulose, the leaves of your plant. It is a complex carbohydrate, which is your cellulose. So these are your carbo hydrates okay we're gonna make you a little bit more um hungry in a second yeah if you haven't had breakfast maybe you make sure you eat some apple. yeah or you can go run quickly and come back and get some that's true breakfast. that's true the benefits of distance learning yes exactly now lipids this is another yummy yummy food group it's we call it comfort food and lipids are com also composed of carbon hydrogen and oxygen now the difference between carbohydrates and lipids is that the chain of this um, lipids is a little bit different and more complex than carbohydrates. Now, its function is these are unused food or energy that is stored in body as fats. So that's the reason why we wanted to watch um, our fat intake because normally this food group is the one that is usually stored in the body and if your body needs some energy later on and they don't have any other source then your body will use fats so when the fat is broken down it provides you energy but it takes a bit of over time for your fats to get used in the bo uh, body if it's stored because it it wants to use an easily accessible um, form of energy first, which is carbohydrate. And some examples of our yummy deliciousness is your chocolate. <laughs> but of course, we know cholesterol, nuts, avocados. Nuts and avocados are healthy forms of fat, butters and oil, animal fats from your steak that you've seen earlier. These are all um, contain fats. Now, the difference between animal fats and uh, plant fats or your nuts, for example, or plant-based fats, is that the kink in their carbon, hydrogen, oxygen chain. So for animal fats, usually it's straight. For plants, it's kind of bent. So that bending of your chain actually um, contributes to how fast or how slow this can be broken down to become a source of energy so just like a little extra for that and really quick on that if we remember from last week with let's take our nuts if we were to take some nuts is this a homogeneous or a heterogeneous mixture hmm. just nuts can i separate them out Wrap it down in your chat box homogeneous or heterogeneous and then if i were to put these nuts into my ninja and then got this seven nut peanut nut 
Fred. Mm. I know. Not Zoom. Look at this. So yes, Emmanuel said heterogeneous. Heterogeneous. Good. And then now looking at that. Ugh. Oh, it's how about though. this one? Can I separate out the walnuts and pecans and peanuts and flax? So what is this no. one now in your in your nut zoo uh, jar over there? Is this heterogeneous or homogeneous? Homogeneous for same, right? Yes, exactly. So Very this good. is an example of your lipids as fats. Nice. Now let's, this is my favorite, proteins. Now proteins, these are large molecules of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sometimes sulfur with it. Okay. And its function is for building. So in, when I was teaching second grade, I call this your grow foods. Now grow foods are used to build and grow and repair muscle tissues. And that's the reason why they say, oh, if you're uh, building muscles, strong muscles, you have to eat more proteins. But, if, but um, contrary to most people's belief, you only can consume enough amount of proteins that your body needs. But of course, this is an important food group because it actually helps your cells to be repaired, to nourish your cells, and so on. And that's actually another importance of your protein is to defend against illness. So antibodies, um, your immunity is actually um, important part of your well-being and therefore proteins help in defending us against illnesses. So that's- And yes. sometimes if you're not able to eat all the meat that you want or you need more, your body's burning more fuel and it needs more to grow, you can use Protein powder. Not recommended for small children, right? This is for when you're older as an adult or oh. parents use it. When you go weight training or put it in your shake or your smoothie or your oatmeal, um, yes, that's definitely you want to try to use natural means first to get all of the different all nutrients different. that you yes, need. Exactly. But there are supplemental and uh, synthetic and not synthetic organic materials organic that materials. can help you out with that too. Yes, yeah, some people uh, prefer... Uh, easily digestible proteins. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's another um, alternative for proteins, right? So some examples, we already know some meat, probably later on you'll, you'll have that for dinner, some fish, eggs, milk, carotene. All right. Now, the next important organic compound that we know, and we discussed this sixth grade, the DNA and the RNA. So these oh, are yes. all repeating chains of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. So Chon piece. So that's how I, I name it when I was in college. So DNA and RNA are composed of these long repeating chains of C-H-O-N-P-S. And of course, the function is storing genetic information from your DNA. And of course, for your RNA, it's the information for cells to create proteins. And again, proteins that your cells may are important in sending different signals of what your body needs to do in order for it to grow, in order for it to uh, develop immunity and all that. So right now, it's very important for us to- It's 10.30. Thanks, computer. And which is why we need all these organic molecules to nourish, of course, your body. And some examples, like I said, DNA, RNA is an example of a nucleic acid, which is an organic compound. Does anybody know how, what DNA stands for? RNA stands for? If you want to type that in the chat. Oh, yeah. Type you it in spell it right. nope. what I'm not going to tell you. See if you can spell it right. We'll do a spell challenge. I'll give you a kickboard point. If you can spell it right and not Google cheat. Don't cheat. <laughs> Don't ask Siri either, Jonas, sometimes. No, right? Class. Good job, Jonas. That's a good use of your skills. But see if you remember how to type or write. You know it's genetic material, but what is the acronym? What does it stand for? Like NASA is an acronym. NASA stands for the National Aeronautic Space Association, right? Uh huh. NROTC, the Naval Reserve Officers Training Corps. MSA, Magnolia Science Academy. Yep, exactly. Oh, I see someone. Aubrey said deoxyribonucleic acid. Yes. That's right. That's right. And how about RNA? RNA. Spelling. RNA. Spelling. RNA. Anybody? Oh, Ribonucleic acid. 
Okay. Well, I'm really excited for you, seventh grade. I love DNA, number one, but it's not on our seventh grade standards, yes. but it'll be on your eighth grade standards. Hey, so that's hey, all you with this light. It's going to be super fun there. Next. And notice how they're color coordinated. You're welcome. And that actually will come into play to help you organize the AT and the CG. Yes. I like to say all tigers can growl, right? Tiger cage. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> right, so, go, go, go. So um, I just wanted to make sure that are doing great. as we, as you guys answer your quizzes later on, make sure that you know and can identify the difference between your carbohydrates and lipids, proteins, nucleic acid. What are the difference? You should be able to describe each. Um, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll post this um, lesson on Google Classroom just in case for your reference when you take your quizzes tomorrow. And of course, explain why these organic compounds are important in our lives. And that being said, I want you to remember and or go back to the list of the two foods that you listed down earlier. All right, Mrs. White's going to explain our very first breakout discussion challenge. All right, so with the people in your breakout room, when we send you out for the breakout room, we open the rooms, you're going to come up with one dish based on the food ingredients or the food that you chose earlier at the beginning of our lesson, and you guys will come up with one dish, okay? You're going to be sharing this at the end of the breakout session with the whole entire class, that you come up with. So here's an example. So let's uh, let's say there are one, two, three, four people in a room. So one person used peanut butter, chicken, and then banana, and then pancakes. So they will come up with a dish or a recipe of whatever it is that you are gonna put together in your breakout session. So they come up with two tablespoons of peanut butter, one cup shredded chicken, one large banana mash, two cups, pancake batter, and a half teaspoon of pepper flakes. Mix ingredients until smooth, heat the nonstick pan, make a round pancake and cook until golden brown on both sides. So this is an example of how you wanted to explain this for the group, for your group, to us later on after the breakout challenge. It shouldn't take very long, but we're gonna set the timer for six minutes. Just pick one out of the two food that you listed down when you get into the breakout group, okay? And if you have any questions, there's a ask for help button in the breakout session rooms, okay? For your food chemistry challenge, this is what you're gonna do on your Padlet board. You're going to make a recipe based on your classmates' shared food. Yum. See ya. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye.